Would you have your Bibles open once again to Titus chapter 2, page 998, please? And we're going to have a look from verse 11 to the end of the chapter this evening. And what we're going to see here is really uh, what we've been building up to thus far in our series in Titus. It's a very simple message here in these verses this evening. That is, grace teaches us to live. And it's right here, right here, this gospel heartbeat at the center of the epistle to Titus, 2.11 to 14 in particular. Grace teaches us to live. Can I show you where we see that in the text? Have a look at verse 11. The main line of this passage is here. For the grace of God has appeared. And it's that grace that brings salvation, verse 11 tells us. But the grace of God trains us, is training us, or teaching us, as we see in verse 12. And here we have uh, perhaps a a translation that, that distracts us slightly from the main verbal point of this entire complex sentence. You can see on the page there, this is one sentence that stretches from verse 11 down to the end of verse 14. And the main thrust of it comes in verse 12 with that little verb, to live. So if we were to translate perhaps a a bit, just a bit more literally, we'd have this. The grace of God has appeared training us so that after we have renounced ungodliness and worldly passions, we might be able, we might live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. Grace trains us to live. Grace trains us in order that we might live godly lives. That's the main line of this passage. But you can see there's more going on here. We're told about the manner of our living in verse 13. We live by waiting, waiting for the blessed hope, the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in verse 14, in verse 14, Paul does what he so often does when he wants to highlight one specific aspect of who Jesus is. He does so by drilling in with this little word, who. Uh, he says, who? And he, and he then unpacks for us some of the riches about Jesus' person and work that he really wants us to understand. And that's what he does here in verse 14. Now, that's a very quick overview uh, of where we're headed this evening. But the point that I want you to get right from the start is that grace teaches us, grace trains us to live. And that living and that teaching is all centered around knowing more about the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace teaches us to live by focusing us on the person and work of the Lord Jesus. So how does that teaching work? That's what we want to know from these verses this evening. How does grace teach us? How does grace grow us? How does grace train us to live more healthy, more godly lives, the kinds of lives that we were looking at in verses one to 10 of chapter two last week? How does grace train us so that we might be those who are characterized by the hope of eternal life, which opened this letter in chapter 1, verse 2? How does grace train us so that we are not like those in chapter 1, verse 16, the false teachers in Crete who were claiming to know God with their lips, but their lives denied that. Their lives denied it because their words and their deeds did not match. Their ungodly lives undercut what it was coming out of their mouths. How does grace teach us so that we can avoid being that kind of hypocrite in our Christian life? That's what we want to know from this passage. How does the Lord intend to teach us by grace? What's the school of grace like? Because this word for training is the word for teaching. In fact, as we'll see, it's the word, it's a big word in in Greek culture in the first century that encompasses what happens not only when a student goes and sits in the schoolroom with a tutor, but the way that young boys and girls are enculturated. It's teaching, not just propositions, but how to live an entire lifestyle, a way of thinking, a way of being, a way of carrying oneself, a way of speaking. That's what this kind of training or teaching is about. And that's what the school of grace in this passage holds out for us. Now, some of you might have had really good school experiences. Others of you, when you hear school, might cringe. You're you're very happy that your school days are behind you. Some of you who are younger here this evening might wish 
from time to time that your school days were behind you. Some who've just sat exams are rejoicing that, in fact, yeah, you might really be to the end of a long life of study that's taken you over several decades. But whatever your experience with school is, what I want you to see in this passage is that the school of grace is a place that we want to be. We all want to have a seat and a desk in this schoolroom. And this is the schoolroom into which the Lord himself invites us, where he teaches us how to live by holding out the Lord Jesus as our God and Savior before us. Now remember the context here again. Where is this letter being written uh, to and when? This is the Apostle Paul writing towards the end of his life to his co-worker Titus, whom he's left on that island in the middle of the Mediterranean, the island of Crete, Lots of small groups of Christians that have, that have come to know and love the Lord Jesus, have repented of their sin, have turned to Christ, and now Titus is left behind to build those churches up. These little church plants around the island need elders to care for them, to teach them, to minister to them, and Titus is tasked with this in chapter 1. And he's up against not only a Cretan culture, which is ungodly, but also false teachers who are continually pulling people away from the gospel of grace. And so Paul tells him he's got to be insistent. He's got to teach these things. Do you see verse 15, how he drives it home? Declare these things, exhort, rebuke with all authority. It's exactly how he started in verse one. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Chapter two bookended with a command from Paul to Titus to do this diligently. Never stop teaching this gospel message of grace. Never stop inviting, in the words of 2, 11 to 14, the people under your care, Titus, into this school of grace. Invite them in and teach them. Teach them faithfully, day by day by day. And verse 11 begins with that little word, for. For. This is the grounds. This is the entire basis on which everything in verses 1 to 10 stands and is made possible. If you were here last Sunday night, you felt perhaps the weight of those commands in verses 1 to 10. Older men, older women, younger men, younger women, bond servants, the equivalent of us as employees in the workplace, everybody, everybody commanded to live godly lives. And it got really specific, didn't it? That's hard to do. How on earth is that possible for us? Well, it's not possible unless we come on to verses 11 to 14. For, for this is possible. The power that drives that kind of living is right here, Paul says, in the grace that has appeared to you. So that's the context of this school of grace. But let's, let's, let's shall we step through the door and take a seat at the desk before us in this school and see what it is that Paul, what it is that the Lord himself by the Spirit wants to teach us from this passage this evening. First of all, verse 11, who has founded this school? Maybe you went to an elite kind of school or maybe you went like me to a rather ordinary kind of school. But sometimes, you know, in school you're called to assembly and you're given stories about the founding of this august institution. And looking back to the founder who laid out a vision for this school. Well, who's the founder of this school of grace? It's right there in verse 11. It's God himself. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. But it's more specific than that. The founder of this school of grace, we're told as we get on to the end of verse 13 and into 14, is not just God. It's God the Son. God the Son, God the Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us. That is the founding of this school. We are invited into a school that goes back ages, but that was set on a firm foundation by the work of the Lord Jesus Christ in his life, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension. He founded this school of grace. And verse 11 says, if you want to find salvation from your sins, this is the school in which you find it, and no other. There is no other place to find salvation except in this school, except to be taught by this teacher, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Without Christ, there is no school. Without Christ, there is no grace. Without Christ, there is only judgment for sinners. 
And how does the teaching happen in this school? How does this grace go out and sink into the minds and hearts of us as students sat there? Well, remember what we learned at the opening, in the opening verses of Titus. If we look back to chapter one, verse three, we get a very interesting correlation. In 2.11, we're told the grace of God has appeared. And Paul uses a, a verb of epiphany there. It's as if it bursts on the scene like an explosion, a glorious explosion that dazzles the eyes. And it's a very similar kind of term to what he used already in chapter one, verse three, when he says at the proper time, this hope of eternal life was manifested, and how does it come? How does it appear to us? How does it teach us? In his word, through the preaching, through the preaching. So once again, we are thrown back on the simple fact that God has provided for us a very ordinary means of teaching us in the school of grace. He teaches us as the word is proclaimed, as it's preached, primarily here in this place on the Lord's day, but also throughout the week as we proclaim that same message to one another, as we read it for ourselves in the scriptures. It's that proclamation of the gospel that teaches us in the school of grace. God himself teaches us through Christ. How do you get into the school of grace? I don't know if you've ever had to sit an admissions exam for uh, maybe a, a, a university place or maybe a selective school, but if you've done so, you probably know what it's like to come into that room with lots of other students and sit down, take up your pencil, and very nervously think, my future might just hang on how I do in this entrance exam. Either I'm going to get a letter in the post that tells me, yes, you've got a place, or a letter that says very nicely, no, I'm sorry, you're not allowed through the doors of this school. Well, how do you enter into this school in the first place? What's the entrance exam? What is the admissions criterion? Well, we're told in verse 12 that it's after we renounce ungodliness and worldly passion, that repentance that renouncing sin, ungodliness, our worldly desires, is an entrance requirement to come into this school. That we've got to be willing to turn away from our sin and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance is an entrance requirement to come into the school of grace. But the news gets even better and better because that repentance is part of this grace. It's part of the appearing. It's part of what God graciously does for us. We can think of it perhaps in another way. Not you coming in to sit down in that examination hall and taking up the pencil, but rather, we're told in verse 14, the Lord Jesus gave himself for us, aren't we? That there's an exchange of places there that just as you're about to take your seat, nervously knowing you are going to fail this exam, there is no way that you can perfectly pass this exam. And in fact, that's what's required for entry to this particular school. To get in here, you've got to have perfect marks, no mistakes, and the exam covers everything. And just as you're about to sit down, a tap on the shoulder comes, and the Lord Jesus says no. Let me take that place. Let me take this exam for you. Let me live that perfect life for you under the law of God, perfectly fulfilling all righteousness, acing that exam in your place so that you might then receive an entrance letter that you did not deserve. That is part of the gracious entry into this school of grace. Repentance, yes. Absolutely, we're told, turning away, renouncing ungodliness, those things in our lives before we come to know Christ that we are ashamed of, that we are struck to the heart when we hear God's law read out, that we know are deserving of his condemnation. We've got to turn away from that, but as we turn away from that, we bring that to the Lord Jesus, who perfectly fulfills God's law for us and who not only sits that exam, but actually it gets better, doesn't it? Actually, he takes our place as we deserve to take the wrath of God on the cross. Judgment and wrath poured out upon us. That's what we deserve. And yet he takes our place. Verse 14 
reminds us of the sweet message of the gospel. He gave himself for us. Jesus instead of you. Jesus suffering instead of you. Jesus paying the debt instead of you. Jesus perfectly fulfilling all righteousness instead of you. That's what grace is all about. A free gift. I asked uh, my boys this week as we were thinking about what is grace really? We use that term a lot, don't we? We talk about grace and we throw that around in church quite often, but what is grace really? And one of the boys answered, uh, said, well, that's not a question in the catechism, Dad. Actually, there's no question, what is grace? And it was an interesting response, because then what it did is to take us back through, where does grace show up in some of the answers of the catechism that remind us what scripture teaches? And suddenly we realized, didn't we, that grace is all over the place, literally. So what is repentance unto life? Repentance unto life is a saving grace. That, that renouncing move, you can't do that on your own. That's part of the free gift of God. But it's not just repentance unto life. What is justification? Justification is an act of God's free grace. He declares you righteous, not because of your obedience and good works, but because of that of the Lord Jesus. What is sanctification, growing in holiness? Sanctification is a work of God's free grace. It is right through that central section of our catechism. And why is that? It's because it's at the center of this book, the center of this good news, grace written everywhere. What is grace? Grace is the free gift that tells you that in Christ, it's all done. It is all done for you. Turn away from your sin and cling to him. That's the message of the gospel of grace. And there might be here with us even this evening someone who has not embraced that wonderful good news message for the first time. And if that's you this evening, can I implore you, can I plead with you to hear this wonderful offer held out, that grace freely offered to you in the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for you is available, that salvation from your sin is available, that grace to cover your shame is available. Would you turn to him this evening if that's you? But for many of you, this is a message that you embraced wholeheartedly long ago. John Calvin says this. He says something extraordinary. You wouldn't expect it from John Calvin. He says, to believe in the good news once is not enough. That's shocking. Surely John Calvin would not say that. He says that as he's reflecting on this text. And he goes on, of course, to put it in context. This is what he means. What he, what he goes on to say is, embracing the gospel of grace, yes, it's necessary to be converted, to become a follower of Jesus. But it's not something that you embrace once and then move on from. You never graduate from the school of grace. Instead, you are a student for life. You're not getting out of this classroom, but it's a classroom we don't want to escape from. And that's what Calvin reminds us, that grace is that free gift offered to each of us, no matter how long we've called ourselves Christians, no matter how far along in this walk of the Christian life we are, but at every single point, those points when the Lord is blessing you and you're going from strength to strength, those points when the Lord is challenging you and you feel keenly that you are in the wilderness, facing suffering, facing persecution even, even, facing confusion about what the next steps are meant to be for you, facing disillusion. Grace is available for you as well. The school of grace is one we never graduate from. So having renounced, having renounced ungodliness and worldly passions, we turn to the Lord Jesus, we enter into that school of grace, we take our seats, and the lessons begin and the lessons carry on over a lifetime. And really, although there are many different periods in the school day, there's only one core subject. So the day begins. The day begins as we got, this is a, this is a religious school, by the way. It's not even a church school, it's God's school. And so the day begins with gathered worship and prayer and time spent in this book so that we can taste and see that the Lord is good as we meditate 
on the fact that the Lord Jesus was given in our place to redeem us. And then the first bell rings and we go on to the next period and we're taught, we're taught by the preaching of the word, taught to think more deeply about what a godly life that accords with the gospel of grace looks like. And then the bell rings again and perhaps we go on to lunch and we're speaking to one another, gathered together for times of fellowship during the week in home group Bible studies, in men's or women's groups. But guess what? The subject is still the same subject. It's still the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for you. The core subject. But look at verse 13. Verse 13 gives us something wonderful here. It tells us that the manner, the manner in which grace teaches us to live is a manner that in involves waiting. Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. What does that mean? What on earth does that mean? To both learn and to live in a way characterized by waiting. Waiting for the appearing of Christ. Grace has appeared, and we see now, as we look back at verse 11, that grace there is really a personification for the Lord Jesus himself, because he's going to appear again, verse 13 tells us. And this is that final appearing of the Lord Jesus. When he comes, and we won't just see him with the eyes of faith, we will visibly, physically be dazzled by his glorious appearance. As the heavens part and the Lord Jesus returns, we will see him. And that, Paul tells us, is part of what it means to be taught by grace to live a godly life, is that we are those who wait eagerly for that appearing, that final appearing. We know that we're sinners who've been saved by grace. We know that we have grace for our every need each day, but we also know that we groan and that we need desperately God's help so that we can persevere and we can live a life that accords with the gospel of grace to be faithful until that day when he comes back again. And so waiting is central as a skill that is meant to be taught, is meant to be practiced, is meant to be embodied by us in the school of grace. And this waiting in Titus is almost a synonym for hope. In fact, hope shows up here, doesn't it, in verse 13? Waiting for our blessed hope. That is the realization of the thing that we hope for now. We hope for it, but then our hope itself will arrive. And remember, we saw this phrase, the hope of eternal life in chapter 1, verse 2, which is so central to what it means to be empowered and growing in the Christian life. So waiting is linked to hope, and hoping in the context of this passage, I think, relates to the direction of our attention. And that's true in both a cognitive sense, and what I mean by that is the way we focus our thinking, our reflection in certain directions. We learn to focus our attention on the Lord Jesus. Maybe you, maybe you've learned a skill like I did as a young boy of paddling a canoe. Has anyone ever tried to learn how to paddle a canoe properly? So you get in the back of the canoe, and if you're like me as a young boy, you say, yeah, 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 Dad, I know how to do this. Okay, fine, let's see how you go. And the paddling begins, and immediately, the canoe tips to the right pretty far, and then I, I switch and I correct, and it tips to the left, and then I put the paddle on the other side, and I'm making my way zigzag across the lake, not because there are waves, not because there's a current, because I don't know how to focus my attention properly to steer that canoe. And then my dad tells me, what you need to do is to focus your attention on a point on the opposite shore that you're aiming for, and then as you paddle, do small corrections, a little bit on this side, a little bit on this side, so that you're focused on the point that you need to get to. I think that's the kind of waiting attention of a directed gaze that, that is held out to us here in verse 13. That as we focus ourselves more and more on the work of the Lord Jesus, and as we yearn for, pray for, direct our attention towards His coming, the reality of that coming, that He's coming in glory, He's coming in judgment, and He's coming to save us once and for all. As we focus our eyes on that, what's the effect? Well, the effect is that everything that we read as challenging in verses 1 to 10, all of those ways that we're meant to live that are in accord with godliness and grace, those 
are made more possible. We're less likely to go off course to the left or to the right as we focus our gaze on the Lord Jesus and especially on his final coming. I think that's part of what verse 13 is holding out to us. But it's not just a a cognitive thinking about it kind of focus. It's a hope and it's a waiting that is also emotional. It, It involves all of us. It's a prayerful yearning and desiring, a groaning, a straining towards that day, which helps us, and again, Calvin brings this to the fore wonderfully in his meditations on this text. He says, we are too much wrapped up in the day-to-day details of our lives. And Calvin doesn't mean that our jobs are not important, that our tasks, our relationships, our callings are not important. Instead, what he means is we too often let those assume ultimate importance, and we forget that the ultimate thing is glorifying the one who has shown us grace in the gospel. And when we keep that thing, the main thing, everything else snaps into proper focus. And it's that kind of yearning that we need to be engaged in as we sit as students in the School of Grace. Well, what kind of graduates are meant to come out of this School of Grace? What's the, what's the graduate profile, if I could use that language? Well, we never graduate, at least not until glory, not until the Lord returns or until he uh, chooses to take us from this life and bring us directly into his presence. But the kind of graduate this school is after is right there in verse 12 training us, having renounced ungodliness and worldly passions, to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. The kind of alumni, the kind of graduates, really the kind of students that the Lord is looking for in this school are students whose lives match the gospel message of grace. Students whose living, whose speaking, whose witness in the world by the things we say and do and don't say and don't do testifies that we have been transformed, that this is true, that this is real. Our lives join up with the gospel of grace. So maybe you, maybe you get together with uh, graduates from one of your schools from time to time. This happens to be the 20th year uh, for me since university. And I've got some friends who have been sending me messages about them having a get together back in Michigan in the United States. And when they get together, they're gonna talk about old times. They're gonna talk about you know, what kind of graduate is produced by the university we went to? What characterizes that kind of person? Can you tell by looking at that kind of person? Aha, that's an old oak. That's a St. Elizabeth's girl. That's a St. Stephen's boy, whatever it might be. Can you tell by looking? That's what this passage is after, to live a self-controlled, a prudent, a, a, a life that joins up in righteousness and wisdom and godliness to the gospel that has saved us. People looking on should be able to say, aha, that's, that's a grace-trained kind of boy. That's a grace-trained girl. It should be evident in the way that we live, a certain kind of training characterizes this person's life. And finally, as we come down to the end of our passage in verse 14, we're given a larger historical context. Uh, so we talked about where the, the, who the founder of the school was, but there's a larger story going back even before the Lord Jesus and his uh, death and resurrection. And we get glimpses of that in verse 14. We're told that Jesus is one who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness. But not only that, He gave himself for us to purify for himself a people for his own possession. A people for his own possession, purified. Adrian read for us earlier in the service from Exodus chapter 19. And you might want to turn back there just now, or maybe it's still still there ringing in your ears. This is what Exodus 19 said. It's Israel gathered at the foot of Mount Sinai, and what's just happened? They have been brought out of Egypt. They have been redeemed from slavery in Egypt and brought out on eagle's wings. It's not something they did for themselves. They were slaves in Egypt. They were blocked in their escape route by this Red Sea, and only by the mighty power of God, the supernatural power of God, were those waters parted and his people brought through on dry land 
And they stand there at the foot of Mount Sinai in Exodus 19, and he tells them, you're mine. You're my holy people. You are my precious possession, a treasured possession. And do you see the echoes here of that in verse 14? You are meant to be a holy nation and a kingdom of priests, Moses goes on. And that kind of language, a treasured possession, a kingdom of priests, a holy people, is repeated over and over in, the, in that section of the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter seven is just one place we could go where again Moses says to the people, remember who you are. You're a people who've been redeemed from slavery, who've been set free. So now live according to who you are. Live as a pure and holy people. And that's exactly the historical big picture that surrounds this text for us in Titus chapter two. Paul is saying to Titus and to those on Crete, and the Holy Spirit is saying to us this evening, brothers and sisters, if you've been saved by grace, then live like it. Live like it. Live as a holy people. Live as a people who love purity, who are striving to grow in purity, who are being taught by grace how to do that, and a people who are, by the end of verse 14, zealous for good works. Live like the people who you are. You have been redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ. Let your lives show it. Let your lives show it so that those good works will be evident to all. And we're going to see in coming weeks in chapter three, this is a, this is a major way for the, wor- for the world, the watching world, to see us, to see us in action as it were. Not as perfect people, but as sinners redeemed by grace, growing in godliness. This calls for wisdom. In each of our lives, this will look slightly different. It calls for prayer. It calls for a prayerful meditation day by day on the fact that we are sinners saved by the Lord Jesus, our God and Savior. It calls for being attentive students in God's school of grace. We never graduate. We're perpetual students. The teaching is daily. Verse 12 We are being trained, and the the training there is exactly as it appears. It's an ongoing, day-by-day training and teaching and molding and formation of what it means to be a grace-shaped Christian. And it happens weekly as we gather here together and as our ministers and our elders hold out for us the gospel of grace in the Lord Jesus Christ so that we might be those kinds of people that we are redeemed to be. So may we delight to be students hard at work at our lessons of grace in the School of Grace in this coming week. Amen.